The prophet Isaiah speaks as the voice piece of God with these words. Do not fear, for I am with you, gathering the dispersed of all the people. From the east and the west, I will gather you in. Friends, no matter our reason for being here this morning, in the sanctuary or online, God has gathered us into this place. Let's reflect on these words as we listen to the song, Gather Us In. gathered around these words, grace and peace be yours in abundance to the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the peace of Christ with you. Now, as we gather in this space, as we hear these words of gathering, we recognize that as much as we miss gathering as a full community, whether um, here in person, online, just being able to talk and um, converse with one another and be in each other's spaces, we also recognize that there is something in us that repels or pushes away people. We hurt them, we sin against them and God, and so we come to this place to confess that sin, that wrong that we do to one another and to God. Today, our prayer of confession comes to us through a prayer we get to pray together. So I invite you, whether you're online using the online bulletin or here in the screen, to pray this prayer of confession with me together. Eternal God, 
We confess that we are prone to hold too tightly to yesterday, neglecting to participate in the new thing you are doing today. We confess that often we are too infatuated with the new, forgetful of the ways you have been a work in the past. Forgive us for the traditionalism that won't let go to embrace the new and for the idolatry of the contemporary that fails to embrace the old. Everlasting God, give us a faith that embraces both the old and the new as we seek to live out our tradition and into the innovation to which you are calling us. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And now we hear these words, these words of grace and mercy and compassion, words of our forgiveness in God. It's true, friends. In Jesus Christ, God has made something beautiful of our lives. Know that you are forgiven people and go forth to live in that peace. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word this morning, we continue that prayer of preparation that we've been learning together, that verse from Psalm 86, Psalm 86, verse 11. I'll say a word or a phrase and I'll just ask you to repeat it with me. Uh, I think this is the last Sunday we're going to be doing this, so hopefully it's kind of been reverberating a bit in your minds, uh, but let's prepare our hearts to hear God's word. Please repeat after me. Teach me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may worship your name. Give me an undivided heart that I may worship your name. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may worship your name. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart 
that I may worship your name. And all God's people said, Amen. The call to return, to come back, to come home. For the past several weeks, we've been listening to the story of the Israelites' homecoming in the book of Ezra. Depending on which biblical historian you most trust, we know that God's covenant people have been exiled and dispersed for some 50 to 70 years. No Zion or holy city, no temple or sacrificial offerings, no center to their religious life, no rituals to hold them in the orbit of the centrifugal force of covenantal community. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, King Cyrus of Persia calls them, allows them to return, to go back to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, to reestablish their religious practices, to reconnect with their covenant community, and to rekindle their faith in a covenantal God. And go back, they do. Their numbers are much smaller. Their cultural prominence, much less significant. Still, they return. Some 50-ish thousand people return, and they begin with something old. They set up the altar, and they reestablish the burnt offerings. They recommit to the religious observance of all the sacred festivals of the Lord. They honor their living tradition following the instructions of their great forebearer Moses, and they reconnect with their covenantal past. As the story unfolds, however, we discover that in addition to reconnecting with their past, they also engage in something entirely new. You see, the history of the Hebrews' uh, construction of the temple under Solomon involved the incredible resources from the king himself. It involved skilled artisans and craftspersons. Even the clergy themselves were exceedingly numerous in helping construct the first temple and in, in establishing the temple practices. But this time around, the second time around, there was no blank check from a monarch. Skilled artisans and craftspeople were hard to come by, and the royal priesthood, which had numbered in the tens of thousands during the first temple's construction, now numbered a whopping 70-some. In other words, once the altar had been built and the sacrifices had begun to be offered, the returning people of Israel had a large task before them in trying to reconstruct the temple and reconstitute the temple practices. This project wasn't funded by some ancient Israelite Rockefeller-type figure. It wasn't built by the Hebrew equivalent of a Frank Lloyd Wright. No, it was an all-hands-on-deck project, guided by the 70-plus Levites called to oversee it. And given the fact that the temple construction this time around was dramatically different than the temple construction the last time around, the Bible is careful to note that according to Ezra 3 verse 8, Zerubbabel son of Shealtiel and Jeshua son of Josadak made a beginning. Together with the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from captivity, Zerubbabel and Jeshua made a beginning together with the rest of the people and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. If the reconstruction of the altar was something old, the reconstruction of the temple was something new. Zerubbabel and Jeshua and all who had returned from their captivity made a beginning. A call to return. Something old, something new. And this morning we pick up where Pastor Elizabeth left off last week in Ezra 3, 10 through 13, and we discover a melding of the old and the new. Listen for the word of the Lord, Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites 
heads of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. Though many shouted for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can you imagine it? The altar's been built, the sacrificial system re inaugurated, the Israelites have raised the necessary funds and secured the necessary materials to rebuild the temple, and the people come together, and the very first thing to do is the builders lay the foundation. Makes sense. Anyone who's in the building trades knows this to be the first step. They lay the foundation. And the priests are all decked out in their liturgical vestments. Trumpets are in hand. The trumpets are complemented by the symbols of the Levites and the sons of Asaph. And once again, the Bible is quick to remind us that none of this was made up on the spot. No, this was according to the direction of King David of Israel. Yet again, we see evidence that tradition is alive and well. The clergy and musicians enact what had been done generations before them, just as it had been originally directed by Israel's monarch exemplar, King David. And then the people sang. And oh, how they sang. Can you imagine it? Undoubtedly, throughout their captivity, they had sung on their own perhaps in small family gatherings. I imagine mothers and fathers singing the psalms to their children as they laid them down to rest at night, perhaps when they rose up in the morning. I imagine grandmas and grandpas sharing the old songs, teaching them to their grandchildren, telling them the stories of what was sung in the good old days when the people flocked to Zion together. But it had been 50 years, at least 50 years, since the Israelites had sung a congregational song. Can you imagine that? In our supposed land of the free, we can't take a one-year hiatus from singing during a global pandemic without facing the backlash of the disgruntled. We think a year is long. Try half a decade without, try half a century without singing a congregational song. So it's no surprise that when they finally do sing, the Israelites sing a song that's been sung before. Actually, it's an old song. It's a song that resoundingly repeats throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. The Bible tells us that they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, quote, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. Now that's a song lyric. God is good. God's chesed, God's steadfast love endures forever. This is the song lyric we hear over and again in Israel's songbook. You'll find this lyric in Psalm 98 and in Psalm 118 and my personal favorite, Psalm 136. In fact, you'll find God's steadfast love endures forever some 26 times in Psalm 136. The psalmist is trying to get us to understand that God's love is a faithfully fierce love a loyal love, a promise-making, promise-keeping, covenantal love. This was no new song for the Hebrew faithful. No, this was the modern-day equivalent of our Jesus loves me or amazing grace. But here's the really incredible thing. The singers in Ezra 3, did you notice that they add a new and really important directional word to that old lyric? Did you catch it? The Bible says that they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. All the songwriters in the biblical story up to this point hadn't specifically narrowed God's chesed. They had all sung about a God whose chesed is big and broad enough to stand on its own two feet. God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Period. End of story. But notice that here we have a direction for God's chesed. And in particular, a more specifically targeted recipient of God's chesed. This isn't to say that God's chesed isn't for all people. As Elizabeth and I often remind our own children, just because I told your sister that I love her, it doesn't mean that I don't love you. 
Sometimes your sister needs to hear it more than you do. And when your sister is hurting or your sister needs, uh, is caught in shame or, or she feels like she doesn't belong or like, like, like she's all alone, she really needs to hear that her mom and dad love her personally and specifically. And well, given all that the Hebrew people have been going through, Given the fact that they, they return a far less hardy and robust group than the one that was exiled some 50 years earlier, given the fact that, that most of them had probably wondered if God had forgotten about them altogether, I don't know if there's any more important way to convey Israel's covenantal connection to the divine dance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. God's steadfast love endures forever toward the abused and the abandoned, the forlorn and the forgotten, the marginalized and the ostracized. For every son who's come home to locked doors and every daughter who's been kicked out, for any and every child who's ever been told a lie that she or he or they don't belong. Ezra 3 verse 11 is a gospel song. This is the good news. God's steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. Yes, even towards you, Israel, and even towards all the ones who feel as if they've been left for dead. It's no wonder the people respond with such a great shout. I mean, the foundation of the temple's laid. The occasions marked by all the hoopla of the priestly garb and proverbial trumpet and percussive cymbal the song of old with a lyrical adaptation pointing to the new, the Israelites must have felt like they were on cloud nine. They were getting their lives back after a season of having lost them. They were able to gather in community as a people in continuity with the place. They were able to make a new beginning out of the rubble of the past. It's no wonder they responded so positively, so hopefully, so loudly to all the promise surrounding them. That is, it's no wonder some of them, some of them responded so positively, so hopefully, so loudly to all the promise surrounding them. Apparently, the community of faith found in Ezra 3 is about like every other community of faith. Among those who were giddy over the new thing God was doing, there were also those who were grieved by it. Ezra 3, verse 12, But many of the priests and Levites and heads of family, old people who had seen the first house on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. The priests and the Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundation. The Bible tells us that they wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. The foundations of this house. Apparently, for all the connections to the past, the new thing that God was doing in this day was not exactly the same. And let's be clear, this isn't just about the foundation of the new temple. It's about every other thing that was different in the world at the time. As one of my clergy colleagues is fond of saying, oftentimes when people react so poorly to changes in the church, it really has more to do with the larger cultural shifts happening beyond the church. Changes that are beyond most pastors' purview or understanding. Even more, when people display strong emotions, i.e. usually anger in these situations, the anger is the presenting issue behind a much deeper and more important emotion, i.e. disappointment or sadness. Something old, something new, a melding of the two. Some respond with a great shout, others weep with a loud voice. In fact, in a moment that for any leader may demonstrate that the Bible does indeed bear witness to profound truth, Ezra 3 verse 13 tells us that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. Joy and sorrow, gladness and pain, tears of, so uh, tears of joy and tears of sadness. This is the emotional reality for any change leader. This is the emotional reality for anyone who leads out of tradition and into innovation. This is the emotional reality of transformation. And here's what I love. Did you notice how Jeshua and Zerubbabel respond they don't 
they don't do a thing. They don't pull out the megaphone and call down condemnation on those who are sad for holding too tightly to the past. They don't throw stones at those who shout for joy for not appreciating the history. No, they they don't judge either group. This is not a cut and dried right way, wrong way to handle change. Both emotional realities are present. And because we don't see some superimposed moralistic overlay of the story, I think that must indicate that the biblical authors aren't so much trying to teach us the way things should be, but rather the way things are. Perhaps the Bible is less interested in telling us what to feel and is more interested in helping us name what it is we are feeling. And if we have the courage, (laughs) oh, if we have the courage to name our emotions, then maybe we'll discover a God who's able to hold the emotional tension of the community. And because God is able to hold it, maybe we'll discover that We can hold the emotional tension with our siblings in Christ too. I mean, maybe this is what being a part of the community of faith is all about. Maybe when we're engrafted into the church of Jesus Christ in our baptisms, we're called to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. Sound familiar? Well, hint. It's biblical. Romans 12. For the past four weeks, we've been listening to this story. To the story of a call to return. We've heard about a people who for at least a half a century had been pulled apart. And we've learned about the way that those same people came together in a call to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the old and begin anew. And it's no secret that we see some similar contours for our own congregation over two and a half millennia later. We, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have faced an exile of our own dispersed and driven more deeply into our own individual lives to protect, protect us from this deadly virus. We're grateful for the modern technologies by which we've kept up some connection, telephone, email, Facebook Live, the local cable television access channels, but it hasn't been the same. And the ache of our disparate lives, discombobulated and disconnected, shows us the cold, hard facts. Return we will, but it will not be the same. We'll eventually return to our old practices of communal connection and congregational collaboration. We'll eventually return to a building where face coverings will not be required, where folks can stand closer than six feet to engage in lively exchanges about sports or politics or even that most treasured church talk, talk chop, topic in Northwest Iowa, the weather where the passing of the peace involves physical touch, and where musical instrumentation accompanies full-throated congregational song. Eventually, eventually, my friends, we will return, and it won't be the same. Some who were physically present in late winter, early spring of 2020 will not be present when we get back to the new normal sometime between now and the autumn of 2021. Some left because God called them into God's good and glad and eternal presence. Others because... Frankly, they were disappointed by the church's approach with the pandemic protocols to keep the most vulnerable in our community safe as possible. I sometimes bemuse with my clergy friends that for the past 20 years or so, many in the church were wringing our hands, believing our perspectives on human sexuality would divide us. But it strikes me as odd and frankly sad that at the local level, our individual perspectives on face coverings may in the end lead to more church division than who can get married or be ordained. And I hope you hear in that a deep, deep sadness in your pastor. All of which is to say, we will return. And it will be glad. We will return and it will be sad. And whenever that day comes, whenever we are able to fully return, let's be clear, there's no going back to the American Reformed Church of the pre-pandemic. It will be a new day. And that new day will be a source of, of bearing connections to the old, to our tradition, and it will be different and new. There will be innovation. We'll sing some of the very same songs we sang before, but it will be important to pay attention to the new ways in which we're called to sing them and the new voices that have joined our congregational choir here in person or virtually online. Joy and gladness, yes. Sorrow and pain, 
Yes. A God who holds us together in God's chesed, God's steadfast love, no matter what. Yes, yes, yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of your word. We give you thanks for the way that you remind us through the story of Ezra to both hold fast to tradition and to adapt and be open to the new thing you are doing through innovation. Help us to be present to our emotions in this, O oh God. Help us to name them in safe communities of authenticity, integrity, courage, curiosity, and love. And give us courage to name them before you. By your Spirit, minister to us through this table as we receive the bread and the cup. May it unite us to you and to all your family of faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. The old way was a soft cube of bread and a little cup dispersed by perhaps um, an elder or a dipping in of the big cup as you came forward. The new way is a wafer, a little bit more like cardboard, and a cup we open ourselves. But guess what? Old or new, the meaning is the same. This table reminds us of our past, our rootedness to God and who we are. It calls us into the presence to be fully that people, and it points us to the future when all will be well and right someday for the promise of God. Friends, we remember that all are welcome at this table. Even children are welcome to participate at the discretion of their parents and guardians. Today we participate um, again with the wafer and cup that hopefully you received as you entered. If you didn't, please just wave, acknowledge. We have um, a couple elders in back, Greg and Daniel, who will bring you those if you need them. And also we invite you when um, invited to do so after the communion prayer to take off your masks so you can participate in eating and drinking together. We'll do that together and then put your mask back on when we're finished. At home, you are welcome to gather your own elements. I believe that our girls are using Powerade this morning, and it's blue, not even purple. So whatever you have will work. Just gather and participate with us. This is the feast of God for the people of God. All things are ready. I can't believe you just told them our girls are using Powerade. <laughs> blue Powerade, not even purple. Friends, please join us in the communion prayer uh, responsively. If you are worshiping online, the words are in the online bulletin. If you're here present in the sanctuary, the words will be on the screen. Together, let's pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and good and a joyful, holy thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty and everlasting God. You created the heavens and the earth. You preserve us with your care. You revealed the fullness of your love for us by sending Jesus Christ. By his life, death, and resurrection, you have reconciled us to yourself. With the heavenly host, and with the saints of all times and all places, we lift up our hearts in joyful praise, saying, Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Accept the gift of our lives that we may live in you and serve your kingdom. Being joined together in Christ, may your whole church be one and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. In the same manner also when they'd eaten, he took the cup and said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Let's do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ given for you. We thank God for God's gracious gift of salvation given in Jesus Christ. As we respond to God's gift of the word, both in proclamation and in sacrament. And we prepare our hearts to pray by sharing just one prayer announcement. A reminder, you should be receiving weekly prayer announcements from the church, either through your email or through um, the U.S. mail. Uh, and those prayer updates, we encourage you to be praying for those listed in those. We want to also add Ryan Rather, a son of Dan and Kathy Cry, who was admitted to the hospital at Sanford Health in Sioux Falls earlier this week with an infection from his feeding tube. The doctors are hopeful. Uh, Ryan is making progress that he'll be able to return home to Orange City today. So we continue to pray for his healing and for Dan and Kathy as they support uh, Ryan and Sarah throughout. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you have fed us with your word at your table grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints we offer to you our prayers for all people god of compassion we remember before you the poor and the afflicted the sick and the dying prisoners and all who are lonely the victims of war injustice and inhumanity and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called O Lord of Providence, holding the destiny of the nations in your hand, we pray for our country. Inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders that they, together with all our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness, so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. O God the Creator, we pray for all nations and peoples. Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide your creatures. Increase in us the recognition that we are all your children. O oh, Savior God, look upon your church in its struggle upon the earth. Have mercy on our weakness. Bring to an end our hap unhappy division and scatter our fears. Look also upon the ministry of your church in this place, American Reformed Church. Increase our courage. Strengthen our faith and inspire our witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present, either in person or virtually online or over the local cable television access channel. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray together. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be, be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come. Your, your will be done, done on, on earth, earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We continue our response to God's word by listening to the song, We Will Feast in the House of Zion. Together, let's listen and worship. done great things 
the promised morning, oh, how long, oh, God of Jacob, be my strength, we will feast in the house of Zion, we will sing with our hearts restored, he has done great things, we will sing. sharing, if you're wondering, um, we're sharing Rosalind today. She's preaching in Hull, so be praying for her. Actually, she might be done already, so hopefully it went well. I'm sure it did. Um, we're grateful for her gifts in this place, and we're grateful that she has this multifaceted giftedness that she can share with other congregations, and for your grace in allowing her to do so as well. So uh, two weeks ago, um, F3, which is still meeting in a new way, um, F3 kids were encouraged to bring and um, give food for the food pantry. Uh, last week, the F3 kids were encouraged to um, do cards for Atlas and uh, sort of spread joy and God's love with our friends at Atlas who serve our community and the surrounding area. These are ways in which ministry continues to happen in new and unique times. And so we don't collect um, passing plates, tithes, and offerings here in worship, but we still have that box in the back to help our ministry continue. You're welcome to also give online or send a check to the church office. And all of those ways, your tithes and offerings contribute to the mission and ministry of Christ in this place. We're grateful for that. As we leave today, again, we'll disperse from the back to the front, just allow everyone to spread out a little bit as you leave, um, and to say hi to your neighbors and to do all that as well. You also should have received by now, those of you that consider American Reformed Church your church home, uh, a packet from the church including your 2020 contribution statement, along with a letter from the generosity leadership team asking you also to continue uh, submitting a pledge card for the 2021 both general fund and then also your time and talent. Uh, pledge cards are due next Sunday, so if you uh, have not yet mailed your pledge card in, please do mail that into the church office as a sign of your commitment to God's call in your life to practice generosity in this coming year. And then I want to offer one little challenge. Uh, in the past few weeks, I've heard a couple of ARC members in conversation mention to me that they're feeling disconnected. Any of you feeling a little bit of that? Perhaps? I know that we are. I love what Benjamin Langton once said in a children's message. He said, you know, Sherry and I, when we teach our kids uh, about friendship, we remind them that in order to have friends, you have to be a good friend. I think the same is true in the church. In order to feel connection to a church, we have to also make intentional efforts. Uh, this week, uh, out of the random blue, I received a telephone call from Paul Van Englehoven. Paul, I'm going to call you back. But he left me a long voicemail that was just kind, checking in, wanted to know how I was getting along with my foot, and then telling me that eventually Landsmere was going to open up and he couldn't wait to see me. It meant so much to me. And then I received a card, a note from Shirley Mao, also living at Landsmere, uh, saying that it was good to see me online uh, with a boot, being able to walk again. Those two contexts meant the world to me. And I believe that as a community of faith, we can make a world of difference to those in our community. So... Make use of that church directory 
And do yourself a favor. Do yourself a favor. Make two telephone calls. Don't send an email. Don't write a note. Make two telephone calls. Have an actual dialogue, a conversation with two people from American Reformed Church that you haven't seen and you haven't talked to for some time just to check in. Ask them how things are going. Together, we can build connection, but it takes each and every one of us. Friends, indeed, we are feeling the call to return, are we not? It's been a long journey. And in that call, we know that we'll experience something old, something new, and we know we'll experience a melding of the two. Be present to your emotions in the midst of it all. Give voice to them in safe communities and with the presence of the Holy Other. And as you do so, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always. Amen.